Uh, we feel a beautiful series um, tonight with Pier Paolo Tamburelli. Um, one of the principals, uh, together with the captain standing behind him, by the way, uh, Andrea Zanderico um, uh, of Balfu. And they will talk, or he will talk, uh, about the team we design. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you. Um, I imagine you, you can hear me like, like this. Is it okay? Let's see. Um, now, Kersens proposed me to, um, to participate in this um, series. Uh, and, uh, and first of all, I would like to thank him and thank uh, all of the guys uh, of the studio uh, uh, for the invitation. And he proposed to me to speak about uh, McKimid and White. Now, the idea was to speak about a building about, of McKimid and White and uh, a building by uh, ourselves. Uh, that is a bit difficult in the sense that McKimid and White is really, by definition, the quantity office. Uh, they realize almost a thousand buildings. Uh, in a relatively short period of time, so from 1879 to 1905, the moment when uh, White was killed. Uh, and on the contrary, we, even in a very optimistic count, we did not realize more than, I don't know, four or five buildings. Um, so it's a, bit, it's a bit different, but anyhow, it's not okay, and I should use both. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's like Madonna. Yeah. Well. Okay. I hope it works. Um, now, to to talk about Makimi the White, it's important to talk about these quantity of buildings, not only quantity of buildings, but also quantity of producers, uh, because it was one of the first offices in the, in the history to, uh, to be really what is now a relatively uh, normal corporate office. So it was actually the invention of a corporate uh, architectural office. So I thought it was not really possible to do one and one. Also because if you reduce McKim and White, McKim Mid and White to uh, to a single building, they are not really fantastic architects. They are extremely interesting, but they are interesting in a series. Um, and I also thought that, uh, unfortunately, we we also in another way. Uh, cannot really so far present a single building that uh, um, somehow express all what we want to do, because as in the case of McKim Middle White, we are many, but contrary to McKim Middle White, we didn't do uh, so far um, buildings that we can consider uh, express uh, what we would like to do in its totality. So. Uh, I prefer to show a series of uh, projects and, and buildings. Now, uh, the point is, why McKimid and White? Uh, again, a not extremely talented bunch of architects of a relatively um, forgotten period. Um, also, um, somehow, uh, a bit backward at the moment in which they, uh, they did their own work, like uh, the American debate that, that uh, for now is nowadays extremely interesting was certainly not the leading cultural debate in the field of architecture in the late uh, uh, 19th century. Like Europe was uh, somehow more fancy and was doing totally uh, different type of things. Um, the, the interest uh, for, for these guys, so you see them, it's uh, William Rutherford Mead, it's on the uh, left, 
in the center there's Charles McKean, and on the right it's uh, Sanford White. Sanford White is the only one who is famous. Like the, the only the only reason why you might have heard about uh, Kim Eden White is that uh, uh, Stanford White was killed uh, in uh, Madison Square Garden, like a building that he himself designed, uh, during a uh, operetta uh, by a, a Pittsburgh billionaire who uh, was enraged because Stanford White uh, had had an affair. Uh, with the, at the moment, wife of the Pittsburgh billionaire, but at the time, a, like 16 years old uh, dancer or something like that. Uh, when you buy a book like the 10 most famous uh, uh, cases, uh, criminal cases in the history of America, uh, this is normally one of the 10 uh, because they were extremely uh, famous and established uh, McKim was personally writing to the President of the United States. They did uh, jobs like, I don't know, the restoration of the White House. So they were really part of the establishment. And then discovering uh, these um, extremely aggressive sexual behavior of uh, Sanford White was a big scandal uh, of the moment and so on. Um, but we will not deal with this. We will deal mainly with the boring side of the story, the story more associated to, uh, to Charles McKim um, and not to Stanford White. Um, the reason why I, I'm interested in, uh, in McKim and White is that it is a collective practice. And uh, uh, I'm interested in these uh, because I happen to have a collective practice as well. Uh, there's no particular reason for that, but at a certain moment, we started an office uh, with, uh, at the time, eight partners and now six partners. And, uh, and this has been, for me and for Andrea, a everyday condition of, uh, of working. And as you can imagine, uh, an office with uh, six partners is a bit complicated to run. Uh, and, uh, and the first thing, like aside from all other complications, there's one major complication that is uh, to uh, take a decision on the subject of architecture, on the subject of, uh, of form, uh, together with other people. Uh, according to a flat hierarchy where there's not, let's say, the boss who tells we do this or we do that. And so you need to uh, develop a um, way of talking about forms. Uh, you need to be able to, uh, to convince people um, whether the plan should be round or squarish or a pentagon or whatever. Um, and this is a quite a complicated discussion. I guess you have some experience of it. Um, and for us, the only way to, uh, to come up with, uh, uh, with a method, with a way of doing architecture, is uh, to work starting from precedent. Like, uh, uh, we want to do this a bit like that. And so always to refer to something that has already been built or has already been designed and that might um, work as a reference. A reference that, can, that is possible to observe, is possible to analyze, and it's possible uh, to, criti to understand and to criticize and to transform. Uh, this idea uh, is based on, on two things. The first is that uh, architecture is made of all of the architectures of the past. And these all of the architectures of the past is understood here in a very everyday uh, sense. So not only the great architecture of the past, not only Palladio and uh, Apollodorus of Damascus, but all of the architecture that somehow has been built. That only because of the fact that it has been built or designed, because of the very stupid fact that it's there, 
can be subject to some sort of understanding and critique and redevelopment. Uh, and this also allows one thing that for us has been extremely practical, that is to, to talk about design decision without becoming too personal, without uh, uh, starting issues of my authorial uh, whatever creativity and Andrea's whatever creativity and blah, blah, blah. Who cares? Uh, and at the very same time, uh, it's something that allows, in our opinion, this creativity, this personal approach to survive because there's no reason to erase that. There's only, it's only important to, uh, to define a system that allows the different creativity of different partners not to uh, destroy the one of the other. So by establishing this um, very abstract level of discussion that of course requires a lot of talking, a lot of uh, um, expression through words, it's, it's a way of doing architecture that is totally um, spoken. So there's no uh, silent uh, inspiration. There's a lot of arguing and trying to convince other people on the basis of uh, the analysis of some previous case. Uh, there, is a, there is a very precise link, uh, we believe, in between these two things. Uh, language, words, and geometry. This is something that is very clear, that has been very precisely uh, expressed by Paul Valéry, um, showing this uh, relation of geometry and words, the possibility to describe what you want, the possibility to, to share and to, and to talk of these things as something completely um, reified something uh, that is available, that is thinking, but it's not, uh, that can become uh, shared and collected. Um, this is something uh, that is interesting to uh, think of uh, if, we, if we think of the work of, in particular, Charles McKim. McKim decided not to uh, make drawings of his own architecture uh, in 19 in 1878, so one year before starting the office, when he was still working together with uh, William Mead without Sanford Y. And the fact that he was not directly drawing his own architecture allowed all of the other employees to uh, enter the process of producing that. Uh, another thing that McKim was doing was um, speaking about the architecture they wanted to do uh, into the office, like really in a super classicist way uh, that of course is also a little bit of a show off of erudition and, uh, but, but was at the same time a way to share knowledge. So there are these uh, memories of employees you have to think that more or less all of the American architects of the uh, of the of the twenty till the twenties uh, had been working uh, with uh, uh, and had been basically taught by McKim, Mid and White, like people like As Gilbert, uh, Carrera Nastings, uh, um, whatever. Uh, well, okay, but more or less uh, uh, all of these architects uh, the all of the architects that were the polemical, um, let's say, enemy of Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright, all of them uh, were coming more, they're coming from the, the McKim's office. Now, uh, McKim was speaking loud uh, about the project in the office, listing these names of moldings like, I don't know, uh, Cima Recta, whatever, Scotia, blah, 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 in Latin even, that seems somehow disgusting, uh, but at the very same time combines a precise name with a precise thing and uh, allows immediately uh, the employees to understand and to 
um, to learn how to do that. And in this, uh, in this respect, um, it's uh, an extremely metropolitan form of architecture. So it was the architecture that was required by New York at the moment in which it was uh, booming. Uh, and uh, and, uh, um, and the metropolitan goals corresponded to the metropolitan tools. The many workers of McKimmy the White were producing the multiple city uh, of New York. Um, this means also that it was um, totally irrelevant uh, what kind of style this uh, architecture uh, would take. Now, um, I make a little detour uh, just to be clear uh, about what uh, uh, I want to say. Uh, this is a, a supposedly Gothic church by Schenkel, the Friedrich Werdersche uh, Kirche um, in Berlin, uh, very close to the Spree. Uh, and Schenkel designed this thing from uh, 1820 to uh, 1830, more or less. He made, uh, I don't know how many different projects. Uh, some of them apparently classical, some of them apparently gothic. Um, you see them like one with, uh, you see the, these four, like one go, uh, Doric, one Corinthian, one with two towers, gothic, one with uh, one tower. So this is another one in the form of the Maison Carré uh, with a strange bell tower on the back and and so forth and so on. Uh, what is interesting is that there's a couple of things about this architecture that never change. So this uh, building is always a box placed uh, in the city in a certain moment, uh, like a box without really a base, like somehow sliding on the pavement uh, of the city. Um, it always have a very clear distinction of facade and uh, back. It's, uh, it's clearly a box with a screen in the front. Uh, and it's just declined in two possible ways, uh, whether it's Gothic or uh, classical. Uh, the classical one is um, framed as a series of uh, um, spatial cells. Uh, separated by these large walls that really gives a rhythm to uh, the progression towards the altar. The uh, Gothic version, that is the realized one, uh, given that the, the toolbox changed, so it's no more the classical apparatus, it's no more an architecture mainly made of walls and pillars, is much more straight, much more direct. Everything runs to the altar. There's not the, um, the sequence that you can see here, where you, you clearly see, for instance, the pavement is completely different. Here is framed through these uh, perpendicular uh, bars. In the Gothic version, it just runs uh, to the altar. Um, what is extremely interesting in this case that then will reappear in, uh, in McKimmy the White, even if, uh, uh, let's say, with a bit less talent, uh, is the capacity uh, to define certain things at the level of the city that never change. So this church is anyhow a box. Uh, then to leave somehow the city, the client, whoever, taking certain decision, like do you want Gothic or classic, doesn't matter. Uh, but once then Gothic or, class or classic is decided to derive all of the logical architectural consequence from that decision. So that uh, in a way, the, the two versions of the church are the same church. They play more or less the same role inside of the city, uh, but uh, once the stylistic option is selected, there are several different possibilities that open up. Now, this 
uh, indifference uh, is somehow a capacity, somehow shows a capacity uh, for architecture to uh, be extremely permeable uh, to the desires, not only of the architect, but uh, of the entire set of people that are somehow um, uh, somehow involved in the production of architecture. So architecture becomes something extremely re receptive. There's no real intention from the architect, from the author. Uh, the, the architect, the author, is somehow just uh, uh, like a curator that puts together all of the different uh, suggestions of the different people involved and produces something that is uh, urban or metropolitan or plural from the very beginning. And there's just a set of, uh, um, let's say, um, critical operation from the architect who doesn't have to invent anything. It's just uh, put together all of the, co the contribution from the other people around, the king who wants a Gothic church, uh, a certain uh, organization uh, of the city, and so on. And all of these um, coincide into uh, an artifact uh, that is um, that gains from this uh, multitude of different uh, uh, desires that are deposited onto it. So in a way, the architect is extremely silent, but at the very same time, he is somehow able to do what he wants anyhow. So with all this discussion of do, uh, Gothic or classicist and all these different projects, then in the end, the building, uh, this is the plan of the building, the building really looks like what uh, uh, Schinkel had in mind in the beginning, that is the uh, Basilica in, uh, in Trier, that is neither a standard uh, classicist building nor a Gothic uh, uh, building. And there's a certain inspiration of form that somehow survive uh, this extreme tolerance uh, for the different uh, um, possible sources, the different possible worlds. Somehow architecture becomes uh, the place where the different desire of the client, uh, the bureaucratic uh, uh, bodies controlling architecture, the regulation, blah, 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 uh, coincide. Uh, and the architect is just um, kind of a movie director able to put together uh, all of these. Uh, this, of course, means that there's a certain degree of uh, um, ab abstraction and indifference uh, in the work of architects. And this is very clear. Uh, in the case of McKimmed and White. And it's also the thing that in the case of McKimmed and White uh, allowed them to do a lot of money. Uh, and there's this relation with money uh, that we probably will discuss later, uh, but it's quite important. So money as one of the elements of the city is taken as something uh, that contributes not only in purely economical terms, but in terms of uh, desires to the production of the city. Uh, money is understood as a form of, uh, um, like a, a psychoanalytical index of certain aspiration. Doesn't matter if elegant or not. Uh, and this thing is turned uh, into uh, a way of production uh, you see these photos of the office of McKimmed and White in several uh, different uh, uh, activities, like, I don't know, playing baseball against another uh, office. Uh, and this is all part of a generation of American architects who had a lot of business to do and who uh, were willing to collaborate. You see all of these people who are the architects who have been responsible uh, for the Colombian exhibition in Chicago in uh, um, 1896, if I'm uh, not wrong. And all these people, uh, like uh, here is McKim with uh, Daniel Barnum uh, hunting somewhere 
in, uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, and you have to think of this world, a world of uh, terribly aggressive uh, capitalistic accumulation, production of, um, like these people were really working for uh, the most uh, rapacious uh, uh, type of uh, businessman you can imagine, the um, uh, Rockefeller, um, JP Morgan were all clients uh, of McKim. Also because uh, it's, it's very important to realize that all what they did was done in uh, New York uh, at the end of the 19th century, so everything was private. Even when you will see the train station, the Penn Station, Penn Station was a private building. There was basically nothing public uh, in the commissions uh, of McKimid and White, except for uh, their work that anyhow was not work of the office, it was more consultancy for uh, the Macmillan Commission and for the plan uh, of Washington. Uh, what is also important is that uh, inside of this uh, world, for McKim, uh, McKim and White took a slightly different position with respect to, for instance, Daniel Barnum. Um, Barnum, for instance, uh, at a certain moment decided to refuse doing uh, small business, so he would never accept uh, commissions uh, for buildings that were costing, I don't know, less than $100,000. Uh, on the contrary, McKimmon and Wine remained uh, committed uh, to do even very small uh, type of works, even later in the career. And this is quite interesting because it shows an interest in dealing with the city at all different scales uh, and always uh, somehow paying attention to this multitude of, uh, uh, not scales, but also multitude of desire, multitude of uh, uh, protagonists uh, that will appear. Uh, into the um, into the the architecture, uh, and this of course means uh, imagining this uh, way of organizing the office that is totally new. Uh, this is a picture showing the office of um, Albert Kahn uh, during uh, um, Second World War, while uh, designing uh, factories uh, for uh, the American army, um, and this is a photo of uh, SOM uh, in the 50s. But somehow this way of producing architecture uh, out of a collective intelligence, uh, where there's almost like the individual contribution is just a detail uh, inside of a larger frame, and where the uh, necessity to um, to define a way of uh, sharing the work and organizing the work is more important than um, defining the very single form of everything. And this is a, an idea of architecture that is actually extremely classical. And in the case of McKimmy de White, it's important to notice that McKimmy de White ended up being a strictly classicist office in terms of style uh, because they started from a strictly classicist method. It is the analytical way of working that led them to produce certain type of architecture. Uh, if, you, if you read the correspondence of McKim uh, from Paris when he studied uh, at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, McKim was absolutely in love with, uh, I don't know, uh, medieval castles, uh, little villages in provincial France, these kind of things. And then only through uh, the, because of the fact that a rational, um, uh, openly discussed way of producing architecture was more effective for the office, he slowly moved to also a totally different uh, formal uh, repertoire. Now, this is also a bit curious because in the context of, uh, of US, um, it's certainly not 
et euh, it's, it's a bit of a strangely polemical model. Uh, this picture uh, is from a movie titled The Fountainhead, and you see uh, Gary Cooper, if I'm not wrong. Um, and Gary Cooper, that somehow um, brings to the movie, uh, let's say, roughly speaking, the character of Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, precisely express this uh, American idea of the uh, free uh, artist uh, directly uh, in contact with nature, uh, opposed uh, to uh, the, um, how to say, the um, uh, constraints of society uh, and, uh, and clearly refers to a typically American way of understanding the relation among individual and society. Uh, in this respect, McKimidon White, that for a short period represented the establishment of U.S. and represented a probably the one and only moment in which uh, America had a clearly metropolitan urban project in which uh, uh, cities were considered good, in which uh, um, there was no uh, idea of isolation into the nature. Uh, in reality, this model uh, proved completely uh, wrong because uh, actually if you if you consider it in the long-term period, uh, um, the I suburban uh, ideology that, to a certain extent, can correspond to the urban models of, of Wright and of Sullivan, uh, completely uh, won. And uh, apparently, um, like what what looked like the architecture of the establishment, the one of McKeem or, and Barnum, was completely uh, abandoned and uh, the architecture of the anti-establishment actually became uh, the, uh, the establishment. Uh, this is quite, uh, it's quite interesting because it's quite, to a certain extent, uh, un-American in the case uh, of McKeem the White. Um, there's also other things that are uh, quite surprising, uh, and for instance, one of the most interesting is this. This is the the first is the building that made the the breakthrough of McKimid and White. Uh, it's um, it's the Villard House. It's the house of uh, Mr. Villard that was the uh, owner of one of the different railway company uh, of the time. I think a railway company connecting uh, Oregon to whatsoever uh, in the Northwest. Um, and this building uh, that is uh, quite closely based on uh, the Palazzo di Cancelleria uh, in Rome, um, has been entirely uh, designed by one of the employees uh, of McKimid and White, a guy called Joseph Morrill Wells, who uh, died shortly after uh, completing this building. Uh, what is interesting here is that the stylistic shift that then becomes fundamental for the future of the office is actually a decision of an employee. So there's no, it's not McKean, it's not Mead, it's not White to decide to start using this. It's the office. Uh, and, uh, and through all the career of McKean and White, this is quite important and it, uh, it is quite important and very clear to all of the three partners that the office is a better architect than themselves. So the, the collaborative production is better uh, the, the individual uh, intuition uh, of, uh, of the three founding partners. Uh, it, it, it's quite interesting that it, in the development of, uh, of such a successful office, the fundamental decision is not taken by the three partners. Uh, 
But the three partners are, um, are intelligent enough and detached enough to accept the fact uh, that it has, it's just one employee who decides uh, what architecture uh, we have to be, or we have to do. Uh, and this architecture uh, is actually um, defined uh, in a very precise way. At a certain moment, uh, McKimmy the White start to use um, the the books of uh, of uh, Letarui, that is a, a neo classical uh, French or Belgian uh, architect who went to Rome and measured all of the buildings uh, of the Renaissance. Uh, he published in. 1840 or something like that, a book titled uh, Les Edifices de Rome Moderne. Uh, and this book, that is simply a collection of buildings, so it's, um, it's not like a Durand or this kind of things where there's a very strict uh, typological classification and the classifying tool is more important than the, the things included in the collection. It's a relatively um, random collection of perspectives, plans, uh, details, uh, views. It's very free somehow. Um, and it's strictly uh, based on surveys. So it's only singular cases. It's not like Durand that there's kind of a method. There's just, here there is just a collection of precedents, just a collection of very precise things uh, that appear uh, in a plurality of levels uh, with, uh, um, with details, uh, with uh, um, consideration about the position in the city, uh, like architecture appears through this collection of uh, single cases in its uh, uh, multitude uh, of uh, um, scales and possibilities. The other thing is that the collection of buildings selected by Le Tarouille is quite clear. It's more or less all of the architecture of Bramante and all of the architecture of Vignola and a little other things. So it's the architecture of a very precise, uh, how to say, um, family of Renaissance architecture. So there's not so much Michelangelo, there's no Palladio because it's from Rome, so there's no Palladio. And, and it's clearly through the, the simple presentation of this collection of cases, it's uh, a very clearly uh, abstract um, collection of things. So um, there's a lot of attention on the spatial organization and there's no ideological uh, commitment in the collection. Contrary to uh, Palladio, for instance, who became at a certain moment uh, like a um, for the, became like a, a way to express a certain set of values. Uh, uh, Palladio himself referred to Roman architecture as uh, uh, not only a system of spatial uh, relation or um, decorative models, but also a set of uh, civic uh, values. And for instance, Palladio called all of his uh, uh, sons with Latin names, these kind of things. Uh, in the collection of Letarui and in the selection of the architects included, like Bramante, Vignola, there's zero commitment. There's just a, an attention on the, uh, on the way the grammar of architecture can be applied. Uh, there's uh, an extremely abstract notion of uh, uh, combining things with totally uh, syntactic uh, kind, of, uh, um, kind of attention. The, the language is much more intelligence, uh, is much more important 
uh, than the uh, than the world. So the system is more important than the single uh, than the content. And this thing is given to all of the employees uh, of uh, uh, McKimid and White. You see here the difference in between this very uh, multifaceted collection of examples by Letaroui and this super systematic uh, definition of uh, um, aggregations by, uh, by Durand. Uh, the, the system of um, the book of Letaroui were given uh, from Kimi the White to the employees, and they were explicitly told to just copy from that. Um, this might seem quite brutal, uh, but in reality, provided uh, the employees in the office with uh, direct access to possible sources for architectural production. So there was uh, like a common language that was shared, and these original common language was not of the reductive, uh, systematic kind of this, but was a much more uh, attentive, even uh, somehow loose uh, starting point. Out of this, uh, McKim, start, McKim and White started to produce an uh, infinite amount of buildings, um, like, I don't know, Boston Symphony Hall, fantastically simple box uh, uh, with this extremely beautiful frame for the orchestra, Madison Square Garden, that of course is not Madison Square, Square Garden of today, because Madison Square Garden has been uh, built and demolished uh, into, um, built, demolished, and turned into new buildings, I think already five times. So where now New York Rangers are playing uh, is uh, uh, just the fifth uh, reincarnation of uh, um, Madison Square Garden. This is the place on the terrace where Sanford White was killed. And actually this is uh, honestly quite ugly building, like uh, with this uh, pastiche uh, with the Tower of Sevilla uh, Cathedral and whatever uh, pseudo-Venetian uh, palace below. But in the large amount of production, you, you see this extremely urban type of architecture, always very committed in responding to uh, to the case. Um, this is the power plant in New York. And you see a situation like this where this is not McKim, but this, it's cities like that where the train was running in the middle of the city. Uh, and this also somehow explains of a certain extremely innovative relation with uh, technology of uh, uh, McKim and White. So you read the, the diaries of these three, at a certain moment, extremely rich uh, um, American gentlemen who started to be traveling in Europe more or less half of the time. McKim uh, was always either in Egypt or in India, uh, whatever, uh, into restaurants and seeing old paintings, these kind of things. Uh, and he was running the office sending telegrams. He was somehow using a technology that looks ridiculous to us, like telegram, somehow like email. He was, still, was able to run the office in New York sending telegrams uh, from Florence at the end of the uh, 19th century. Um, that is something that is totally different from the way uh, the contemporary European uh, architects would work. The moment in which McKim, uh, Mid and White had an office of under 20 employees, I don't think there were more than three or four draftsmen in the office of Otto Wagner or uh, whatever other European uh, uh, architect of the time. And certainly, uh, and it's quite interesting to see that the extremely conservative uh, 
in uh, formal terms, Office of McKimmed and White is in productive terms extremely innovative uh, to the point that it, it goes completely beyond the romantic idea of the, of the artist uh, that would still be um, unchallenged, uh, for instance, by uh, the avant-garde, like Bauhaus uh, tried to build for the masses, but never even consider the fact that uh, also the masses could also become the architects. Um, it was always a very, um, like the status of the artist, the status of the architect was never challenged uh, by, by these uh, supposedly ex extremely politically committed avant-garde. And in a way, even if uh, absolutely conservative and clearly related to uh, American billionaires of the time, the model of the office uh, proposed by McKimmy the White is uh, much more interesting. Because the, uh, the, the, person run, the, the three persons running the office are clearly not geniuses. They are, um, they are simply defining the condition that allow the collective intelligence of the office to be put at work. Uh, and through this gigantic uh, production, there's honestly also real masterpieces. Uh, this is a, the low house, a building that has been destroyed, unfortunately, uh, and that is kind of the grandmother of Venturi's um, mother's house. It's this gigantic shingle uh, house with this um, very big roof. It's a very big house. Looks uh, like uh, not like relatively um, normal, but it's really not. And um, this is a bit how it looks like. And you you see the complete uh, um, the very wide range of possible solutions. Um, and one of the extreme cases is simply copying and pasting. Uh, this thing is uh, um, Palazzo Grimani by San Michele in Venice. And this is Tiffany's uh, in, uh, uh, in New York. You see that the adaptation are very, very little. Uh, the only thing that changes is that the the motive with the Serliana uh, that makes the fact that the, there are three main um, bays and two smaller ones uh, disappears into this more homogeneous uh, facade. The rest is, there's no big invention. It fits into that place, it can be a perfect Tiffany why to think of something else. Uh, this process becomes even more uh, paradoxical in the case of uh, Pennsylvania Station. Penn Station uh, is this um, New York station of the Pennsylvania Railroad uh, that was again a private uh, railway company. That's also the reason why at a certain moment this building has been destroyed because the owner wanted to make money with his own property. And uh, um, railways in the US after the 50s started to collapse. Uh, and so he decided to redevelop uh, the site. This is also the, the demolition of Penn Station marks also the beginning of the um, uh, preservation debate uh, in US. Um, what is interesting is that this building is relatively anonymous building. It's just gigantic buildings occupying two blocks. But if you see it from the side, it's not particularly uh, relevant. It kind of disappears into the metropolis just to then um, appear once again 
uh, as an interior space in this uh, gigantic uh, vaulted space uh, that is uh, uh, the um, the copy of the main uh, hall of the Tepidarium, I think, of uh, Caracalla Bath, just enlarged uh, 20%. Uh, and this strange act of combining inside of a, a railway station of 19th century, uh, a thermal bath of the uh, third century, uh, it's kind of a surreal paradoxical enterprise. It actually requires a lot of knowledge, a lot of talent, a lot of skills, and in reality, all these skills are somehow hidden because in the end, the only thing you do is to redo uh, something that was already there. To a certain extent, there's some sort of uh, nihilism in this, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, operation. Uh, and this uh, nihilism, it's not so different from these. Uh, this is just much more um, intellectually charged, and much more bitter, uh, much more nasty. And not by chance, this has never been built, and uh, McKimmy the White has been uh, extremely successful. In a way, other flows is the architect, even if he's uh, like 20 years younger, I think the, cu the cultural position of other flows in the European debate is somehow similar to the one of McKimmy the White. Uh, the only difference is that Lowe's uh, um, is too bitter. It's also much more intellectually uh, conscious. That makes his architecture much better, but also much more difficult to realize because it's somehow hurting. Uh, while McKimmy and White can go a little bit uh, unnoticed. Um, and also the other difference is that uh, while McKim was confronted with an uh, incredibly growing uh, country and city, uh, Adolflos was actually working in a relatively declining Vienna of the early uh, 20th century. But the, the idea is more or less the same. Like, uh, we have to do a big train station and we copy uh, the, um, the Roman baths and uh, we have to do the, 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 the most beautiful building in the world and we just copy uh, a Doric column. What is, um, what is similar in these two cases, just to conclude about McKim, uh, is that they both refer to a notion of architecture uh, that is critical. It means that every, all of the things that might appear into the architecture are already given. They are already given into the city. and. They just need to be understood, combined, and analyzed. And not by chance, both McKimmy and White and Lowe's are opposed to notion of architecture uh, that are um, that do not that are not an, in which architecture is not understood as critique, but is uh, understood as fiction, as literature, as invention. Uh, both uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and the architecture of the uh, Wiener Secession were into creating a new war. Uh, Loos and McKim are not busy with any new war. They are just taking position towards reality. There's uh, extreme uh, realism in uh, this architecture. And one of the cases uh, that expresses this uh, most clearly is uh, the series of uh, projects for banks uh, that McKimmy and White produced throughout uh, their career. 
I will show you a few of them. This is Bank of Montreal, the back of Bank of Montreal. Uh, this is not a bank, it's the New York, yeah, no, it's the National City Bank in New York. Another one, I think, in Winnipeg or whatever. Again, smaller, bigger, for all kinds of plots. And this is probably if I have to come to one building by McKim, I think this would be uh, the building. Uh, and this building is uh, Bovary Savings Bank, that is a mid sized bank uh, uh, in Bowery in uh, Manhattan. What I think is extremely interesting in these uh, series of projects of banks is that you always have uh, a certain plot that is given that uh, uh, McKee, Mid and White are really attentive in not wasting. You see all the, the perimeter of the plan really follows the, the plot. And then this geometry, this random geometry of the plot is confronted uh, with the precise uh, geometry, let's say, of the discipline. It is somehow the city that is directly confronted with the discipline and somehow it's always the city that is more important. The city is allowed to criticize architecture, while on the contrary, uh, McKimmed and White don't think that architecture is allowed to criticize the city. In a way, it's a very conservative point of view on architecture. Uh, uh, you, you just have the plot, and the plot is good. Also, there's a certain... Um, how to say, uh, Protestant uh, uh, religious uh, consideration of private property. This is property, it should not be wasted. But by taking property with this small fanatic uh, capitalistic uh, uh, dedication, uh, McKimmed and White are able to analyze the city case by case. Like all of these banks are kind of little treaties on different plots on how and, and the placing of columns inside and these different strange corners, place where the plot doesn't correspond to an ideal geometry and then somehow the architecture is able to register this little uh, difference. Uh, somehow McKimmed and White is never tired of uh, recording the actual geography of the city. There's always attention, there's always uh, the extreme uh, respect, I would say. And, and this is probably uh, the most clear case because uh, the very particular geometry of the plot uh, allows this spatial invention with these two rooms and with these columns uh, um, dotting the two main rooms and the very different relation in between the column and the pilaster against the wall that you see for instance in the upper side of the plan on the on the right there's more space in between the columns uh, and the paraste uh, against the wall uh, and you see all these set of very subtle um, differences that become the architecture. Somehow the architect has really no intention, he just has a plot, and he's just uh, commenting with extreme dedication onto somehow the hidden history that is uh, um, concealed into the pure cadastral map. And you see, for instance, how this appears also in the elevation, you see that the uh, the, the street is not uh, perpendicular to the first uh, room and there's this little distortion that appears into the vault that you see into the, um, into the elevation. In this case, probably more than in other cases, there's really a lot of care for, these, uh, for this site. Uh, 
somehow McKim mid and white here are a little bit more gentle. Normally, it's relatively robust, almost brutal uh, architecture. But here, there's a certain there's, there's more there's more attention, and this like the entrance has kind of a asplund uh, or even sidza kind of tone, in which uh, the different geometries are slightly adapting uh, to each other. And by doing this, they somehow uh, record the complexity uh, of, the, of the urban field. Uh, can I have a sip of water? And now I think I can talk a little bit, uh, but please tell me if it's too much. I can talk a little bit about things that we are doing in our office, so maybe uh, it becomes clear a bit more what we um, this is a, a competition for um, that we did, I think, already quite a few years ago uh, for for the expansion. Like this is our competition entry. This is another thing. Um, the competition entry uh, is was for the expansion of the Asplund Library in. Uh, in Stockholm, and by by checking the previous proposals by Asplund, we found these. This is a, the the library has been completed in 1924, and this is a project for an expansion for these uh, uh, annex uh, buildings. Uh, you see, there are these four slabs, where, of which one is a bit bigger. And then there's a very big squarish building on top of the hill. Uh, when we were asked to imagine an expansion of the library, we found this drawing. And we thought uh, that the drawing was OK. Like the project by Asplund was OK. And there was really no need to, to invent uh, anything new. Got it. But of course, first of all, there was no um, historicist uh, um, agenda in our saying the Asplund project is OK. Because this is only one of the series of different projects uh, uh, made by Asplund for the expansion of the library. So, and it's neither the first, the supposedly original, nor the last, the supposedly uh, final. It's just one of the possible uh, projects. And, and we thought it was extremely interesting because it was uh, able to, um, to provide uh, um, this relation with the hill on the back. And of course, uh, uh, we thought that the, the big squarish building on the, on the hill made no sense and that there was also no real reason to have one of the four buildings uh, longer than the others. Um, so the Asplund project became this thing with the four slabs maintaining this relation uh, with the hill. And of course, the Asplund project uh, uh, was not connected. It was four buildings. So this desire to copy uh, had a lot of complication. First of all, that they wanted a single building with one uh, very big uh, public space. So in order to have this thing um, appearing uh, outside, uh, the building was uh, organized like this. So there was a very big underground part like the collection of the library was into the four towers. That was the more private part of the, of the library. And the public part was this terraced underground interior landscape uh, that looked a little bit like this. And, uh, and here, of course, there's a, a hidden reference to the Belvedere and also the organization of the bookshelves as uh, um, Italian garden 
uh, is quite uh, is quite evident. And this is how it looked like. Another case um, of uh, aggressive copying uh, in a way, uh, but also somehow displacing uh, the, um, uh, the original, uh, um, the meaning of the, uh, of the original is this thing. This is a project for uh, Italian pavilion uh, at the Shanghai Expo of 2000, I don't know, 10 or 12. And this is the axle from below of this building. Uh, and you see a plan on the top, and you see section and elevation. Basically, it's like a gigantic ceiling floating on top of a, a completely open exhibition space. And in, uh, inside of this ceiling are like uh, uh, excavated this system of uh, uh, vaults. Um, somehow, the thing looks like, in the end, like a ruin in which you don't have the, contrary to a normal ruin where you have the foundations and you don't have the vaults, here you have the vaults and you don't have the foundation. It's somehow also like a cast, like a negative of a building that doesn't exist. Um, the building that doesn't exist that provided the starting point for these uh, you might even see, you might see the five chapels and the nave. So the starting point is this, uh, and this is the project uh, um, by um, Antonio di San Gallo, the first project by Antonio di San Gallo for uh, San Giovanni dei Fiorentini, as reconstructed by uh, Manfredo Tafuri. Um, this is a very strange church, uh, actually. Then San Gallo built the church after losing the competition to Sansovino and then Sansovino uh, building something that collapsed uh, into, the, um, into the river um, like after one year and so leaving the city because the police was searching him. Um, this is a project that uh, that is extremely radical for uh, Antonio da San Gallo, that is normally not a particularly radical architect. Uh, and it's a project that is based on a very strange reconstruction of the Etruscan temple, whatever uh, it might have been, that was applied in this case by uh, San Gallo because the, the church was for uh, the Florentine community in Rome. And it's this extremely low church with this uh, um, obsessive accumulation of barrel vaults uh, that would remain extremely dark also because there's not that many sources of light and that would have produced a quite strange and interesting uh, space, uh, not, not really clear whether oriented in one direction or the other, somehow looking like a dark mosque in a way. Uh, and this was the starting point for uh, the production of this uh, space that here you see uh, reproduced uh, in a model. This is how it would, uh, like this one piece of the model, like you see really like a cast of a non-existing space. Uh, this is also because what we were asked to do was a, was a pavilion, so something that had to represent somehow Italy in an expo, and it's, in my opinion, it's impossible to represent a country with a pavilion. You can just relate to a certain uh, cultural tradition, and that was our attempt uh, with this thing. And you see this system of uh, vaults that should have been realized in phono insulating material, like uh, uh, producing also 
silence inside of these large uh, 40 by 40 rooms, inside of this uh, expo that is normally a super noisy, uh, hectic uh, environment. And this is a bit uh, how it would look like uh, this thing that would always been seen from below. Other case of combination of strangely different sources this is a project for a church in somewhere in Norway. Don't even remember where. Um, and this is the plan and elevations. You see the front facade the back, the side, the, um, the upper level, the level of the choir, uh, the, the, ch the main uh, uh, church hall and the services on the, uh, on the lower level. And the church is somehow the product of uh, uh, kind of a bastard of these strange fathers like uh, this thing by OMA of the early 90s. Fantastic project, probably the most beautiful thing they ever did. Um, Villa Malaparte. And this Schinkel church, the um, Elizabeth Kirke. And then the solution of the door that is cut in the middle of, as you see there, that is just uh, smashed against uh, the porch, uh, repeats the same solution of uh, Bramante San Pietro in Montori. And somehow here, uh, we, with no reason, because Bra Bramante had to do this because the, the, the San Pietro in Montorio uh, thing is so small that if you really cut a door, a normal door where a person could pass, it's bigger uh, than the rhythm of the paraste. So he was somehow obliged and he simply realized that and didn't care to change uh, all of the rhythm and somehow show the problem. But in our case, there was really no need to cut the paraste uh, with, um, with the door, but um, I don't know, somehow we like that. Um, that's a church. You see the, the door cutting the thing with this clumsy porch for the, for the couples on the, for the weddings. And they, they could not stand in front of this strange bubble. So we made a little bit of a porch for the background of their wedding uh, photos. This is the interior and the back, probably the best part of the church. But if the other cases were cases of combination of sources, uh, this is more about uh, um, positioning and using the plot. Uh, this is a, a project for the expansion of uh, uh, the library in uh, Ljubljana. The library in Ljubljana is the orange building um, that is a fantastic building by Plechnik. And there was this plot into the city where there's also a little bit of Roman ruins underground uh, that, of course, could have been uh, simply ignored by, but given that it's um, Slovenia and it's quite precious there, so they wanted to keep that. And, uh, and this, is, this is the plot uh, that is given. Yeah, you see the Asplund, uh, the, Aspl the Plechnik Library in the front and the big shape of the building on the back. And and by simply taking the perimeter of the plot and maintaining uh, the existing building on one side, it was possible to create a new open space, like uh, on the back, and to turn uh, the, um, uh, 
uh, the entrance to the library to the other side, somehow discovering a new possible urban uh, sequence uh, on the back, and somehow discovering the richness of the urban uh, situation where um, somehow the competition brief was not really uh, looking at. This, I think, is the last thing. Um, this is an a archive in uh, Milano. Um, the building is uh, the archive, uh, and the building is called House of Memory, and it is uh, um, the archive and the offices and some exhibition spaces for a series of association, like the association of uh, um, former fighters in the um, partisans uh, group who fought the civil war that, um, uh, that developed uh, at the end of Second World War in Italy, opposing uh, the fascist and Nazi to the um, democratic partisans. Um, and other association like association of uh, relatives of victims of terrorist attacks in the 70s and so on. So this thing is called Owls of Memory um, and it's an archive and, uh, and actually is a monument. Uh, so we, we were confronted the, with this relatively uncommon uh, task of produce a contemporary monument. Um, something that should remain, uh, something that is not constantly updated, that remains somehow as an obstacle. And, uh, and what we decided to do was to do this building that is extremely simple, like a box. Um, it's also a building that should, should be extremely cheap, uh, so there was not that much uh, uh, space for inventions. Uh, and we decided to, to have this very simple box decorated uh, with uh, um, representations of, uh, of the events uh, of the history, um, of the recent history of Milan. Uh, this is also somehow for us a way to, to not to be forced to, to express uh, any content or to um, provide any symbolism with the building, but somehow leaving everything to uh, the, um, the representation inside these frames. So we understood the building as a box, and on the surface of the box, uh, these events are reproduced as in a medieval uh, polyptic, where uh, there is a combination of um, main uh, representation, like in this uh, thing by Piero della Francesca, and smaller uh, fragments. Um, this idea of the polyptic that then appears into this very clear distinction of the, of the building in three uh, layers, layers of mm, uh, geometric patterns, a layer of portraits, and a layer of big uh, uh, historical events. You, you have to imagine that the upper one is um, eight meter high, so they are quite big. The, like the building is relatively small, but, the, but these uh, uh, images are relatively big. And, and this thing is realized in brick, uh, following uh, uh, a tradition uh, that is typical of Milano. Um, one thing that, uh, when we considered 
uh, case, recent cases of people dealing with collective memory, uh, with events so important and so scary, we, the, the thing that came to our mind um, at first is this series that you probably know that is titled 17 October or 18 October 1977. Um, that is a series by the German painter Gerhard Richter about uh, the uh, conclusion of the uh, story of the so-called um, Badermeinhof band, so the, the group of uh, uh, German left-wing terrorists uh, um, composed of uh, Andreas Bader and Ulrich Meinhof and so on, who suicided, uh, it's not completely sure, but uh, suicided on the night of 18 October uh, 77 uh, in a prison uh, north of Stuttgart. Uh, the series is quite, quite interesting because it clearly refers to this medieval example of collective uh, painting the collective memory, but Richter really doesn't want to doesn't want to judge, doesn't want to, to stand. He just wants to paint uh, the impossibility to forget and at the same time the impossibility not to forget. So these pictures are not directly the event. Like in all uh, Richter uh, painting, they are uh, repainted after uh, photos taken from newspapers and the like. And there is this combination of these different uh, size and, um, uh, and, and formats, like this is uh, uh, called uh, Festname, I think, um, capturing, and it's a very big painting. It was the building where uh, the terrorists were captured. And these are portraits of, uh, I think she's Gundrun Esselin, again, in another moment. And these, these paintings have also very different formats. And this is the same uh, uh, Esselin uh, found dead. And this is the funeral that is a gigantic uh, uh, painting of, I think, four meters or something like that. And this is a painting of a portrait of Ulrike Meinhof as a young uh, student or worker much before uh, his uh, career as a, as a terrorist. Um, what is interesting for us in, the, in this series is the capacity to put together uh, different elements, so to compose a representation of collective memory that is clearly plural from the beginning. Um, and at the very same time, this attention in somehow representing, but, but at the very same time not representing the thing, somehow not judging, remaining somehow a bit detached and um, and working much more on the possibility or impossibility of remembering than on a precise interpretation of the events. Um, in our case, this thing is more clumsily made simply by the fact that these images are reproduced uh, through bricks uh, of six different colors. And uh, this is like uh, Somehow these, uh, these very big images are just like uh, super small pixelated images uh, uh, saved at extremely low resolution and then are uh, blow up and realized like every single pixel correspond to a little brick. Uh, the result is somehow similar. These things are relatively clear from afar, like from 50 meters, they appear quite clearly. And when you come closer to the building, uh, somehow the images uh, disappear. 
And of course, the sources of these things are many and very uh, varied. This is a library uh, by Wano Gorman in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Mexico City. And this is a, uh, a photo by Bas Princeton of certain parts of uh, um, contemporary Egypt. Um, and this is here just because while we were doing that building, we were um, following research in, in Egypt. And then things somehow combine in in strange way. And, and somehow I, I never really thought about this. But when I prepared this lecture, I thought, well, in the end, it's the very same thing. It's a, it's a very boxy thing, super rough. Uh, filled with bricks, uh, with little windows, um, somehow uh, kind of ostentatiously rough and poor, uh, and somehow monumental just because of its uh, uh, poverty in a certain extent. It's like a, just a storage of memory, like um, uh, a silo in a way. This is uh, how the building, after uh, several stages uh, of reworking, became. That's what is being realized at the moment. And this is how the uh, images will be produced. It's an extremely simple technology. It's just people laying the bricks one next to the other, according to these uh, color codes, and it will look more or less like this. And the last thing is about the internal uh, organization. Um, we we clearly try to do a storage like uh, a a deposit, and uh, and we started to look at examples. And for instance, this thing on the uh, left. On the left is a corn house in uh, Bern. Uh, and in some German uh, uh, cities, um, these very big uh, uh, storages of corn in the, in the Middle Age were so important from a strategic point of view that they started to be placed in the middle of the city and they were very big. There's, for instance, another very big in Ulm, very beautiful. And just because of their sheer size, they started to become kind of public buildings. Because once the corn was away, it was the biggest room in the city. And so it was the place of assembly, uh, of assembly uh, for the population. Uh, this thing and this other uh, building that is Orsa Michele in Firenze that actually has the very same plan of uh, uh, the House of Memory um, are both uh, a strange combination of uh, corn storages and churches or uh, assembly places. And another thing that we uh, consider was this buildings that are the uh, le scuole, the schools, uh, like a charitable institution in, in Venice, um, the Scuola della Misericordia by San Sovino and the Scuola di San Rocco uh, by um, Scarpagnino, I think, or Lombardo, in which you clearly see this relation of room and stair, just one big space uh, and a big stair. Um, and given the uh, extreme um, reduction of the available budget, uh, we thought that the interior could look like uh, Brazil in the 50s or 60s. And this is how, in the end, is the plan of the building. You see with the two pillars in the middle and the stair and the table, uh, creating this strange tension uh, that is produced by the fact that you have the, 
um, the column in the middle that again is uh, somehow operating as kind of a obstacle. This is the section with this gigantic object that is the stair somehow uh, compressed into the building. And this is the, you see the archive on one side and the offices on the other. And you know, the last thing I wanted to say was, and you see the, the big object, uh, uh, the big stair in between the, um, the archive and the other, and the offices on the right. And the fact that the archive can have a lower ceiling somehow allows to have more floors and to uh, increase the scale uh, of, um, of this space. Uh, that's it. Um, thank you very much, Pierre. Thank you very much for this very beautiful lecture. Um, it's already quarter past eight, so I guess it's pretty late for many questions. However, I could imagine uh, there's one or two. I would limit it to that point. Uh, and in order to at least provoke a little bit, uh, I don't have the most amazing question, but since you uh, described uh, Sullivan and Obrich as the respective uh, adversaries of, uh, or at least the context to which um, McKim, Eden White and, and Lewis were, were obviously, um, you could say, as embracing the city, reacting. Who would be your contemporary um, Obrich or your contemporary Sullivan or Sullivan's? Um, in other words, what is the context into which you feel you operate when you uh, engage in this trajectory? Um, yeah, first of all, I think uh, maybe not all bricked, but Sullivan is a fantastic architect, so I didn't want to, uh, to argue against Sullivan. Um, and actually, I also believe it's possible to do architecture in a completely different way. So it's not that it is not possible to do architecture out of um, somehow some sort of uh, desire for expression that, that, that has a lot of problem to be turned into words. The only thing is that I'm not able to do that uh, and my partners also uh, are not able. So. So we do this very, if you want, we do this very derivative work uh, because of lack of talent, in a way. Uh, then you also need a particular talent to, to work into that lack of talent. If you, if you would ask me somebody who works in a totally different way um, today, um, I don't know. I... Very close to us, you might argue, our former partner. Ah, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but, but I, I, I would like to, men to mention somebody that I respect, not, not somebody that I cannot say, I don't know, Libeskin, because it makes no sense. Uh, um, I don't know, I, I think in, in a way, in a way, I think even Pascal or uh, uh, Raphael uh, or uh, Oljati work in a completely different way. And, and, and honestly, even, even if I think uh, the results are sometimes extremely good, I, I sometimes feel kind of... Uh, um, like extremely perplexed when the way uh, these things are produced is presented. Mm -hmm. So if I see Book of Oljati with the food that he eats, uh, I think, come on, give me a break. Uh, it, it's, it's really strange to me. But then the architecture that is produced is interesting. 
Um, yeah, I think that's uh, that's probably. No, maybe a, a last comment and then hopefully uh, or a question. Then somebody from the public still wants to ask a question. Um, you bring up laws yourself, right? And of course, I somehow understand because you were asked McKimmedon White. Of course, I think people here should know that because of you've been writing about McKimmedon White and you <coughs> expressed a big interest in them. Um, of course, the moment you bring up laws, and I must say for me it was interesting to see you doing that, I was like, yeah, of course, Lowe's is much closer in the, to the extent that, um, I mean, Lowe's at least operates with a very limited set of possibilities, uh, is far more conscious about his position, um, and, I mean, is far more, I would say, provocative, because you could project all kinds of things on McKimmy and White. Ultimately, I mean, here there's a lot of play, like Lowe's, by the way, with the idea of production, with the idea of repetition and copy and so forth, but it's a lot of insider jokes. I mean, if you don't tell us uh, the, the specific uh, Sansovino church you're referring to, uh, nobody would ever guess, right? I mean, so, so how do you look at that yourself? I mean, is that true? I mean, do you finally I mean, feel more connected to, to uh, Lowe's as an architect? even though you are obviously fascinated by the architecture of McKinney and White? Or am I wrong? Yeah, well... I, th I think Lewis is a better architect than McKinney and White. But in a way, McKinney and White are more interesting... Uh, no, more interesting. They are also interesting because they are different, because they had this fantastic opportunity. And even if they were not fantastic architects, they managed to do amazing architecture. And this is also one of the things that is interesting, that, uh, that maybe the occasion is even better than the architect. And in many times, the architect is better than the occasion, and he doesn't really have the chance. Like Piranesi, I'm sure Piranesi would have been a fantastic architect. If you, if you see the, the few cases in which he had an opportunity, or uh, also the realistic projects, the ones that have not been realized but were meant to be realized, like the, um, the choir of San, San Giovanni Laterano, uh, it's simply amazing. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I never really felt the desire to write about Lowe's. I think, in a way, Rossi wrote so well about Lowe's that I don't think there's anything left to say. And that's also why um, McKimmed and White is a bit more interesting for me to, to talk about, because nobody really uh, considered, like, there's no really fundamental text uh, on McKimmed and White. It's a bit uh, free for exploration, in a way. In a way, in their complete boredom, in their total uh, banality, they are a bit exotic because, I don't know, I think uh, I... I didn't even know about them when I was studying at the university. It's something like that at a certain moment, I, I don't know how I happened to, to learn about them. It's not even that they are so unknown. It's just me uh, who's a bit ignorant. But, uh, um, and then maybe if somehow it's obvious that you you relate more to laws, it's, it's also a way to escape from it. Because uh, I, I, if we compare McKimmed and White and Lowe's, it's immediately clear that they're the nasty sense of humor of other flows killed his uh, uh, business uh, prospect. Like, uh, uh, and I... And I fear uh, we might have similar problem, but I would like to not to have, to be honest. Uh, 
Any anybody else still wants to ask a question here? Yeah, but it's again the same question. Yeah, it's the same question. <laughs> no, sorry, but uh, ah, well, but but also because I don't think we are here to talk about, uh, let's say, your favorite architect. No, 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 exactly. no I think you do, you do the job. Like, uh, if the question was your favorite architect, my favorite architect is Bramante because he was more nasty than Lowe's and more successful uh, in terms of building than McKimmy than White. But he was even better than both. But, uh, but we didn't ask the question. But we didn't. <laughs> I was not asked that. And I think you, you also have the, the freedom to, to be interested in many different things. And, and sometimes you also spend a lot of time uh, considering things that are not really... At a certain moment, I, I, I was considering doing a PhD about uh, uh, McKimmed and White. So I studied the thing uh, a bit. And, uh, and this doesn't immediately mean that they are fantastically better than, than anything. It's just... Uh, bit of a combination also. Another question? Last one? Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, in the way that you are looking at the work of uh, is there a parallel with the way that uh, Kuhas is looking at, at junk space? I mean, like, putting a, um, having a, an eye on how capitalism with uh, no ideology is able to produce, uh, uh, because of its lack of ideologies, uh, able in a, in a time to be very efficient and uh, to produce things and to learn from that, even though you're saying you don't, uh, you're not good at what they do, you're interested. And is there a, a parallel? Um, well, First of all, I don't think capitalism is deprived of ideology. I think there's a lot of ideology in capitalism. Um, also, as much as I say that the architecture is sometimes banal and so on, I think McKinley and White are extremely good architects and they made fantastic buildings. So, and I don't think Colas is really arguing that junk space is amazing. Otherwise, it would have picked a different name for it. Um, no, I don't have this kind of pseudo-sociological interest in McKimmy the White, no. The, the, the main interest is the fact that they managed uh, starting from architectural talent that was not amazing to produce very good architecture because of uh, a very interesting series of decisions about how the office was organized. And uh, that I think it's extremely interesting the way in which they put to work this collective intelligence. And I think this is extremely contemporary and very valuable. Um, a discussion on how um, capitalism of the late uh, 19th century was able in America uh, was able to produce fantastic cities is something that I think might be attempted. I think it's a very interesting uh, subject because American cities um, shortly after that started to grow in a completely different way, basically because of the invention of 
of cars and of the um, diffusion of, of, of cars. Uh, but this is not my scope. I, 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 I don't even know how to start uh, such a research. I, I think it's a very interesting topic, but, uh, but it's not a topic for an architect, I think. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Pierre. I mean, I would like to 